The Jataka Volume 1 by Robert Kalmers, 1895 at sacredtext.com Praise be the Blessed One, the Arahat, the Perfect Buddha. Book 1, Ikanipata. Number 1, Apanaka Jataka. This discourse regarding truth was delivered by the Blessed One while he was dwelling in the great monastery at Jeta 1 near Shavati. But who, you ask, was it that led up to this tale? Well, it was the treasurer's 500 friends, disciples of the sophists. For one day, Anath Pindika, the treasurer, took his friends, the 500 disciples of other schools, and went off with them to Jeta 1. Whither also he had a great store bought of garlands, perfumes, and unguents, together with oil, honey, molasses, cloths, and cloaks. After due salutation to the Blessed One, he made his offerings to him of the garlands and the like, and handed over to the order of the Breathen, the medicinal oil and so forth, together with the cloths. And this done, he took his seat on one side, eschewing the six faults and sitting down. Likewise, other disciples of other schools saluted the Buddha, and took their seats close by the sight of Anath Pindika, gazing upon the Master's countenance, glorious as the full moon, upon his excellent presence, endowed with the signs and marks of Buddhahood, and encompassed by a fathom's length with light, and upon the rich glory that marks a Buddha, a glory that issued, as it were, in paired garlands, pair upon pair. Then, though in thunderous tones as of a young lion roaring in the red valley, or as of a storm cloud in the rainy season, bringing down as it were the Ganges of the heaven, and seeming to weave a chaplet of jewels, yet in a voice of eightfold perfection, the charm of which ravished the ear, he preached to them the truth in a discourse full of sweetness and bright with varied beauty. They, after hearing the master discourse, rose up with hearts converted, and with due salutations to the Lord of Knowledge, burst asunder the other doctrines in which they had taken refuge, and betook themselves to the Buddha as their refuge. Thenceforth, without ceasing, they used to go with the Nath Pindika, carrying in their hands perfumes and garlands and the like, to hear the truth in the monastery. And they abounded in charity, kept the commandments, and kept the weekly fast day. Now the Blessed One went from Savashti back to Rajgriha again. As soon as the Buddha had gone, they burst asunder with new faith, and returning to the other doctrines of their refuge, refu reverted to their original state. After some seven or eight months' stay, the Blessed One came back to Jetavan. Once again, too, did Anath Pindika come with those friends of his to the master, making his salutation and offering of perfumes and the like, and take his seat on one side. And the friends also saluted the Blessed One and took their seats in like manner. Then did Anath Pindika tell the Blessed One how, when the Buddha departed from his arms on his arms pilgrimage, his friends had forsaken their refuge for the old doctrines again and had reverted to their original state. Opening the lotus of his mouth as though it were a casket of jewels, scented with scents divine and filled with diverse, perfu di diverse perfumes by virtue of his having ever spoken aright throughout myriad eons, the Blessed One made his sweet voice come forth as he inquired, is it true that you disciples have forsaken the three refuge for the refuge of other doctrines? And when they, unable to conceal the fact, had confessed, saying, It is true, Blessed One, then the Master, then said the Master, Disciples, not between the bounds of hell below and the highest heaven above, not in all the infinite worlds that stretch right and left, is there the equal, much less the superior, of a Buddha in the excellences which spring from obeying the commandments and from other virtuous conduct? 
Then he declared to them the excellences of the three gems as they are revealed in the sacred texts. The following amongst the number of all creatures, Prithan, whether footless, of these the Buddha is the chief. Buddha means a, a person embodying wisdom. It doesn't refer to a person or a character, by the way. Whatsoever riches there be in this or in the other worlds, and verily the chief of the faithful, thence he went on to say, no disciples, male or female, who seek refuge in the three gems that are endowed with such peerless excellence are ever reborn into hell and the like states. But released from all the births into states of suffering, they pass to the realm of devas and there receive great glory. Therefore, in the forsaking of such a refuge, for that offered by other doctrines, you have gone astray. And here the sacred text should be cited to make it clear that none who to find release and the supreme good have sought the refuge in the three gems shall be reborn into the states of suffering. Those who take refuge in the Buddha found shall not part thence to states of suffering. Straight away they shall quit their human frame, a deva form those faithful ones shall fill. Those who have refuge in the doctrine found those who have refuge in order found, there manifold the refuges men seek the mountain peak, the forest solitude. When he this refuge shall have sought and found, entire release in his from every pain. But the master did not end his teaching to them at this point, for he went on to say, Disciples, Meditation on the thought of the Buddha, meditation on the thought of the truth, meditation on the thought of the brotherhood. This, this it is that gives entry to the fruition of the first, the second, the third and the fourth paths to bliss. And then he had preached the truth to them in these and other ways, he said, in forsaking such a refuge as this, you have gone astray. And here the gift of several paths to those who meditate on the thought of the Buddha and so forth, should be made clear by such scriptures as the following. One thing there is breathing, which if practiced and develops, conduces to utter loathing of the world's vanities, to the cessation of passion, to the end of being, to peace, to insight, to enlightenment, to nirvana. What is this one thing? The meditation on the thought of the Buddha. When he had thus exhorted the disciples, the Blessed One said, So too in times past, disciples, the men who jumped to the fatuous conclusion that there was no refuge, was a, what was no refuge was a real refuge, fell prey to goblins in a demon-haunted wilderness and were utterly destroyed, whilst the men who clave to the absolute and indisputable truth prospered in the self-same wilderness. And when he had said this, he became silent. Then rising up from his seat and saluting the Blessed One, the layman Anath Pindika broke into praises and with clasped hands raised in reverence to his forehead spoke thus, It is clear to us, sir, that in these present days these disciples were led by error into forsaking the supreme refuge but the bygone destruction of those op opinionated ones in the demon-haunted wilderness and the prospering of men who clave to the truth are hidden from us and known only to you. May it be pleased the Blessed One, as though causing the full moon to rise in the sky, to make this thing clear to us. Then said the Blessed One, It is solely to brush away the world's difficulties that by the display of the ten perfections through myriad aeons I won omniscience, give ear and hearken as closely as if you were filling a tube of gold with lion's marrow. Having thus excited the treasurer's attention, he made clear that the thing that 
rebirth had concealed from them as though he were releasing the full moon from the upper air and the birthplace of the snows once upon a time in the city of banaras in the Ka- kasi country there was a king named brahmadatt in those days bodhisatta was born into a merchant's family and growing up in due course used to journey about trading with 500 guards traveling now from the east to the west and now from the west to the east there was also at banaras another young merchant a stupid blockhead lacking resource now at the time of our story the bodhisatta had folded 500 carts with costly wares of banaras and had gotten them all ready to start and so had the foolish young merchant too thought the bodhisatta if this foolish young merchant keeps me company all along and the thousand carts travel along together it will be too much for the road it will be a hard matter to get wood water and so forth for the men or grass for the oxen either he or i must go first so he sent for the other and laid his views before him saying the two of us can't travel together would you rather go first or last thought the other there will be many advantages if i go first i shall have a road which is not yet cut up my oxen will have the pick of the grass my men will have the pick of the herbs for curry <coughs> the water will be undisturbed and lastly i shall fix my own price for the barter of my goods accordingly he replied i will go first my dear sir the bodhisatta on the other hand saw many advantages in going last for he argued thus to himself those who go first will level the road where it is rough while i shall travel along the road they shall already have traveled their oxen will have grazed off the coarse old grass while mine will pasture on the sweet young growth that will spring up in its place my men will find a fresh growth of sweet herbs for curries where the old ones have been picked where there is no water the first caravan will have to dig to supply themselves and we shall drink at the wells they have dug haggling over prices is killing work whereas i following later shall barter my wares at the prices they have already fixed accordingly seeing all these advantages he said to the other then you go first my dear sir very well i will said the young said the foolish merchant and he yoked his cart and set out journeying along he left human habitations behind him and came to the outskirts of the wilderness now wildernesses are of five following kinds robber wilderness wild beast wilderness drought wilderness demon wilderness and famine wilderness the first is when the way is beset by robbers the second is when the way is beset by lions and the other wild beasts and other wild beasts the third is when there is no bathing or water to be got the fourth is when the road is beset by demons and the fifth is when no root or other food can be found and in this fivefold category the wilderness in question was both a, dr- a drought and a demon wilderness accordingly this young merchant took great big jar water jars on his carts and filling them with water set out to cross the 60 leagues of dev- desert which lay before him now when he had reached the middle of the wilderness the goblin who haunted it said to himself I shall make these men throw away their stock of water and devour them all when they are faint. So he framed by the magic power a delightful carriage drawn by pure white young bulls with a retinue of some 10 or 12 goblins bearing bows and quivers swords and shields he rode along to meet them like a mighty lord in the carriage with blue lotuses and white water lilies weathered around his head. with wet hair and wet clothes and with muddy carriage wheels his attendants to in front and rear of him went along with their hair and clothes wet with garlands of blue lotuses and white water lilies in their beads and with bunches of white lotuses in their hands chewing the eculent chewing the eculent stalks 
and dripping with water and mire. Now the leaders of the caravan have the following custom. Whenever the wind blows in their teeth, they ride on in the front of the carriage with their attendants around them in order to escape the dust. And when the wind blows from behind them, they ride in like fashion in the rear of the column. And as on this occasion the wind was blowing against them, the young merchant was riding in front. When the cobbling became aware of the merchant's approach, he drew his carriage alongside from the track and greeted him kindly, asking him whither he was going. The leader of the caravan too paused his carriage to be drawn aside from the track so as to let the carts pass by, whilst he stayed by the way and thus addressed the goblin. We are just on our way from Banaras, sir, but I observe that you have lotuses and water lilies on your heads and in your hands and that your people are, are eschewing this esculent succulent stalks and that you are all muddy and dripping with wet. Pray did it rain while you were on the road and did you come on the pools covered with lotuses and water lilies? Herein the goblin explained. What did you say? Why? Yonder appears the dark green streak of the forest and thence onward there is nothing but water all through the forest. It is always raining there. The pools are full and on every side are lakes covered with lotuses and water lilies. Then as the line of carts passed by, he asked where they were bound for. To such and such place, was the reply. And what wares have you got in this cart and in this so and so? And what might you have in this last cart which seems to move as if it were heavily laden? Oh, there's water in that. You did well to carry water with you from the other side. But there is no need for it now as water is abundant on ahead. So break the jars, throw away the water and you may travel easier. And he asked, Now continue on your way as we have stopped too long already. Then he went a little further on till he was out of sight. Then he made his way back to the goblin city where he dwelt. Such was the folly of the foolish merchant. that he did the goblin's bidding, and had his jars broken and the water all thrown away, without saying so much even as would go in the palm of a man's hand. Then he ordered the carts to drive by. Not a drop of water did they find on ahead, uh, did they find on ahead, and thirsty, exhausted the men. All day long, still the sun went down, they kept on the march, but at Sunset they unyoked their carts and made a lager, tethering their oxen to the wheels. The oxen had no water to drink and the men none to cook their rice with. And the tired out bands sank to the ground to slumber. But as soon as night fell, the goblins came out from their city and slew every single one of those men and oxen. And when they had devoured their flesh, leaving only bare bones, the goblins departed. Thus was the foolish young merchant the sole cause of the destruction of the whole band, whose skeletons were strewn in every conceivable direction, whilst the five hundred carts stood there with their loads untouched. Now the Bodhisatta allowed some six weeks to pass by after the starting of the foolish young merchant, before he set out. Then he proceeded from the city with his five hundred carts, and in due course came to the outskirts of the wilderness. Here he had his water jars filled and laid in an ample stock of water. And by beat of drum he had his men assembled in camp and thus addressed him. Let not so much as a palm full of water be used without my sanction. There are poison trees in the wilderness. Let no man among you eat any leaf, flower or fruit which has not been eaten before without first asking me. With this exhortation to his men, he pushed on into the wilderness with his 500 carts. When he had reached the middle of the wilderness, the goblin made his appearance on the Bodhisattva's path, as in the former case. But as soon as he became aware of the goblin, the Bodhisattva saw through him, for he thought to himself, There is no water here. Is this 
there is no water here in this waterless desert. This man with his red eyes and aggressive bearing casts no shadow. Very likely he has induced the foolish young merchant who preceded me to throw away all his water and then, waiting till they were worn out, has eaten up the merchant with all his men. But he doesn't know my cleverness and ready wit. Then he shouted to the goblin, Be gone, we are men of business, and do not throw away what water we have got before we have, where more is, before we see where more is to come from. But when we do see more, we may be trusted to throw the water away and lighten our carts. The goblin rode on a bit further till he was out of sight and then betook himself back to his home in the demon city. But when the goblin had gone, the Bodhisatta said to his men, Sir, uh, the Bodhisatta's men said to him, Sir, we have heard from these men that yonder is a dark green streak of forest appearing where, where they said it was always raining. They had got lotuses on their heads and water lilies in their hands and were eating the stalks whilst their clothes and hair were uh, wringing wet with water streaming off them. Let us throw away our water and get on a bit quicker with lightened carts. On hearing these words, the Bodhisattva ordered a halt and had the men all mustered. Tell me, he said, did any man among you ever bear here before today that there was a lake or a pool in this wilderness? No, sir, was the answer. Why it's known as why it's known as the will uh, as the waterless desert. We have been told by some people that it is raining just on ahead in the belt of the forest. Now, how far does a rain wind carry? A league, sir. And has this rain wind reached any man here? No, sir. How far off can you see the crest of a cloud storm, of a storm cloud? A league, sir. And has any one man here seen the top of even a single storm cloud? No, sir. How far off can you see a flash of lightning? Four or five leagues, sir. And has any man here seen a flash of lightning? No, sir. How far off can a man hear a peal of thunder? Two or three leagues, sir. And has any man here heard a peal of thunder? <sighs> no, sir. These are not men but goblins. They will return in the hope of devouring us when they are weak, when we are weak and faint after throwing away our water in that building. And the young merchant who went on before us was not a man of recourse, but likely he has been fooled and thrown, uh, th throwing his water away and has been devoured when exhaustion eschewed, ensued. We may expect to find his 500 carts standing just as they were loaded for the start. We shall come on them today. Press on with all possible speed without throwing a drop of water. <laughs> Urging his men forward with these words, he proceeded on his way till he came upon the 500 carts standing just as they had been loaded and the skeletons of the men and oxen lying strewn in every direction. He had his cart unyoked and ranged in the circle so as to form a strong lager. He saw that his men and oxen had their supper early and that the oxen were made to lie down in the middle with the men around them. And he himself, with the leading men of his band, stood on guard, sword in hand, through the three watches of the night, waiting for the day to dawn. On the morrow at daybreak, when he had had his oxen fed and everything needful done, he discarded his own weak carts for stronger ones and his own common goods for the most costly of the derelict goods. Then he went on to his destination where he bartered his stock for wares of twice or thrice their value and came back to his own city without losing a single man out of his company. This story ended, the master said, thus it was layman that in the times past the fatuous came to utter destruction, whilst those who cleave to the truth, escaping from the demon's hands, reached their goal in safety and came back to their homes again. And when he had thus linked the two stories together, he, as the Buddha spoke, 
the following stanza for the purpose of the of this lesson on the truth then some declared the the soul the purest truth but otherwise the false logicians speak let him that's wise from this a lesson take and firmly grasp the soul the purest truth thus did the blessed one teach this lesson respecting truth and he went on to say what is called walking by truth not only bestows the three happy endowments the six heavens of the realms of sense and the endowments of the higher realm of brahma but finally is the giver of uh, arhantship while what is called walking by untruth entails rebirth in the four states of punishment or in the lowest castes of mankind here caste i don't it may refer to the caste system uh, but uh, uh, by the writer but i think uh, caste really means a mindset uh, i would not be sharing this story if i uh, thought of caste in any other way so we have different kind of mindsets oriented to different kinds of lessons that people have to learn mm-hmm. and uh, i think that is what is men- mentioned here further the master went on to expound in 16 ways the four truths at the close of which all of these 500 disciples were established in the fruit of the first path having delivered his lesson um, and his teaching and having told the two stories and established the connection linking them the master concluded by identifying the birth as follows devdatt was the foolish young merchant of those days and his followers were the followers of that merchant and the followers of the buddha were the followers of the wise merchant who was myself so uh, this is uh, this is the first jataka tale uh, thank you very much for listening uh, some footnotes here uh, that the triple gem and the doctrine is not like you need to convert yourself into uh, any kind of uh, order or religion it was Uh, really three principles that were uh, shared uh, i don't know if i understand them completely but this is what i understand so the triple gem first is buddha or wisdom uh, that you must uh, that you must cultivate wisdom and there are many ways to do this uh, but that is uh, what it is that first thing is to cultivate the wisdom uh, the second dhamma is to apply the wisdom you know because many people can wax eloquence but their talking and their walking are not aligned and uh, it can actually be difficult to walk the talk but uh, this to me is dhamma and the third is sangha surrounding yourself with like minded people people who are trying to inculcate wisdom and trying to walk the wisdom that they've inculcated um yeah that's it and uh, now there are some questions from this uh, uh, which i would like to present as a case study for people so in your life uh, where have you made decisions without verifying the facts you may have noticed that the bodhisatta asked very specific questions how far can you see a peal of thunder and uh, has anyone uh, can you hear a peal of thunder and has anyone heard it uh, many times in our lives also we make decisions uh, without verifying the facts of the situation so is there any decision that is pending and have you verified the facts have you noticed the signs uh, that are available to you uh, if you have uh, you can share in the comments below thank you